Okay, it is time to take a look at topic 10.2, titled Fields at Work. We're going to cover topic 10.2 in one lesson. It's actually not that long. So let's take a look. First, we do have a lot of lesson objectives considering how short this lesson actually is. First one, you will be able to determine the potential energy of a point mass and the potential energy of a point charge by the end of this lesson. You will be able to solve problems involving potential energy. You will be able to determine the potential inside a charged sphere. It's pretty easy. You will be able to solve problems involving the speed required for an object to go into orbit around a planet and for an object to escape the gravitational field of a planet. You will be able to solve problems involving orbital energy of charged particles in circular orbital motion and masses also in circular orbital motion. And you will be able to solve problems involving forces on charges and masses in both radial and uniform fields. Okay, so let's take a look at orbital motion. So, uh, generally the definition of a satellite is that it's an object orbiting a more massive body. So its kinetic energy will be given by one-half mass times velocity squared, no surprises. Its potential energy will be given by its gravitational potential energy, uh, the formula for which we have seen in topic 10.1. Uh, this formula is in your data booklet, however, under 10.2. Okay, so uh, just to define some variables here, uh, G is equal to gravitational field strength. Big G is equal to the gravitational constant. I'm not sure why that little g is there, actually. It's not in our equations. Um, R is the distance between bodies. M is the mass of the large object, and little m is the mass of the satellite. So, uh, sorry, uppercase M there is the mass of a large object. And V is the velocity of the satellite. And here is a diagram that kind of shows the relationship between all of our variables. Uh, velocity has been cut off. Okay. So, the uh, total energy of the orbital system will be given by the sum of kinetic and potential energy. And that looks like this. Okay, so there is our total energy. Additionally, an object with circular motion has gravitational force acting on it, and it's acting as a centripetal force. So, we have this equation. Uh, where we have centripetal force equated to gravitational force. And you'll note that this equation, uh, the mv squared divided by radius, can be found uh, in topic 6. So, uh, we can solve this equation uh, for velocity squared in terms of the gravitational constant times the mass of large body divided by r. And we're going to uh, first write this down because you need to know it. Second, we're going to take that value for velocity squared and plug it into our equation here. And we will find that total energy can be simplified down to negative one half times the gravitational constant, times the mass of large object, times the mass of the small object, divided by the distance between the two. And you may recognize this from uh, topic 12. Now, there are a couple of further implications that we should look at here. So, our total energy is equal to kinetic energy minus potential energy, and our potential energy is equal to double our kinetic energy. Okay, so if you look at the math on the left there carefully, you will note that the kinetic energy is in fact uh, double the potential energy. 
okay? So we can further simplify this equation such that total energy is equal to negative kinetic energy of our object. And again, uh, we saw this in topic 12. Okay, so uh, here we have a chart showing us how total energy, kinetic energy, and potential energy will vary with radius, okay? So you can see all three on one single chart. How convenient. Note that we have uh, all energies varying inversely with relationship. So if you were to plug um, one divided by x into your calculator, you would get a curve that looks just like these curves. Uh, the negative sign on our energies are due to the direction of gravitational attraction. So it's just telling us uh, which direction that gravitational attraction is, and it's toward the larger body. Okay, we have a few other implications to discuss here. Uh, and you just need to know these. So you just you should write these down and memorize them. You need to know it. Okay, so if your total energy has a positive value, then the smaller object is going to assume a hyperbolic path away from the object with mass m, large m, and never return. Second, if total energy is zero, the smaller object will assume a parabolic path to infinity but not beyond, because it will stop uh, at infinity, which I realize seems like a silly thing to say. Uh, you're going to have to trust me here. Obviously, it's never going to return. If total energy is negative, the object will either assume a stable orbit, uh, either circular or elliptical, or will crash into the larger object. So these are the only conditions there that can occur if total energy is negative. Uh, we have also seen the conditions required already for a stable circular orbit. Okay, so this is just a diagram that kind of summarizes this stuff that I've told you to memorize. Uh, do with it what you will. And now it's time to talk about escape velocity. So escape velocity is the initial velocity required to launch a projectile from a body such that the projectile will come to rest at an infinite distance. And I realize that seems like a paradox. Um, just think in terms of asymptotes. Uh, you probably all have a, a little bit of uh, experience with calculus at this point. So Think of it in terms of an asymptote, and it, that should make a little more sense, I think. Okay, the total energy of such a system must be zero in order for the object to come to rest, and we therefore have this equation. So total energy is equal to kinetic energy minus gravitational potential energy, and these are equal to zero, which means that we can... Uh, set those two terms of our equation to be equal to each other. And if we solve that equation for escape velocity, we will find that escape velocity is equal to the square root of 2 times the gravitational constant times big M divided by R. And there are the definitions for those. This equation is in your data booklet which is pretty convenient. Uh, the reality of this situation is there are some other factors that would complicate the calculation for escape velocity, uh, including air resistance or gravitation from other bodies. And what that effectively means is that the escape velocity you calculate is going to be uh, slightly too small compared to the actual escape velocity. But or IB physics. We don't worry about those things. We are looking here at approximations. 
Okay, weightlessness. So weightlessness in a craft orbiting the Earth or other mass is just due to the fact that the astronaut and the craft are effectively free falling toward the planet. So if you took an elevator and rode it up to the top of the Empire State Building, and then you cut, cut all the cables such that the elevator will accelerate toward the planet at maximum acceleration, what you will find is that for a few seconds inside that elevator, you will be weightless or apparently weightless. Uh, so similarly in an object orbiting the earth, uh, both objects, uh, the person or astronaut inside the object and the spaceship or craft are accelerating at the same rate. And the direction of acceleration, uh, much like in our elevator example, is toward the center of the planet. The normal force between the astronaut and the surface perpendicular to the direction of acceleration will therefore be zero. And the Sokos text shows the derivation of the math uh, you might want to take a look at it, but uh, these three points, I think, will cover what you really need to know. So if you want to go into more detail, you should definitely look at it, but um, I don't think you would need to know more than this for examination purposes. These three points, though, uh, probably good to take note of. I looked up one past paper question on weightlessness and it had these three points in the mark scheme. So there you go. All right, next up we have inverse square laws. And uh, both formulae for gravitational and electrostatic uh, forces, sorry, that should say forces, tell us that our respective forces vary inversely with the square of distance. Um, between the objects, okay? So if you look at the formulae for forces in subtopic 10.2, we've seen them both before, so I did not reproduce them here, but um, as we've pointed out now a number of times, uh, these forces are uh, proportionate to the inverse of distance squared. Okay, so the geometry of a sphere gives us a possible explanation, and you can see in the diagram uh, the geometry of uh, just a slice of a sphere as we're expanding away from a source of either a gravitational field or an electric field. It doesn't really matter too much, but you can see those field lines uh, penetrating an area and the density of field lines per area is decreasing. And so we can explain this phenomenon using the geometry of the sphere, but uh, there is actually some other stuff going on, which we could check out in topic seven, but uh, mainly you just need to know that uh, force is inversely proportionate to distance, and that's probably about it. Okay, my sources are there, and that's it. Uh, I will have a handout for you and some exercises that you should complete, uh, actually quite a few. I think the uh, handouts are gonna take quite a bit longer than the lecture did, um, not unusually. Okay, have a great day, guys.